Welcome, Council Member Cunningham. How are you? Okay, looks like you're on mute. Let me unmute you. Yes, uh, sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you for having me. That's great. You were wondering what's going on. Thank you so much yes. for taking time. Sorry about that. Yes. How's your day going so far? Very busy. <laughs> Yes, I can imagine, and it's a little late out there, so we really appreciate you taking the time to join us today. Yes, thank you for asking. So let's get on with it. Uh, you know, I know you have a hot stop, right? Uh, in about uh, 40 minutes, so let's, uh, let's get on and we'll have a good discussion. Great. So really appreciate you taking time. So today, uh, this is a reality check with Rishi. It's uh, Thursday. And we have a very special guest and we are going to talk about racial inequality. We have been having these discussions with uh, many leaders from our community. And specifically, we had a discussion, uh, a very, very engaging discussion with uh, black student union leaders uh, just last week. And so this discussion continues today, but uh, with a force from the city of Minneapolis and uh, Minneapolis has been the epicenter of uh, this outbreak of this expression against uh, race inequality. And this has rallied communities all across. I mean, there are uh, mostly every continent on this planet that has engaged with this very significant issue and that has rallied behind in support. And we have become allies of our black brothers and sisters. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of years of atrocities that have played out here in the United States. And it's time that we are asking to change. It's time for us to change, a changing of hearts, a changing of minds, and a changing of how we need to interact and, and, uh, and work with each other in society. And some of these crimes need to stop and not tomorrow. They need to stop today because that's the calling that we have. So you, when we look at 50 states today have participated in peaceful and also somewhat violent protest, making this a big collective demonstration of global civil unrest. I mean, this is unprecedented. We, just, we were just hearing President Obama talk about it and he says that I've never seen this expression in my lifetime. And this is something that has really brought us all together and we need to figure out you know, what we can do moving forward. When George Floyd was killed, outrage built in Minneapolis, several buildings were damaged either by fires or by looting and uh, and uh, we are wondering you know, what the plan is for the city to go about putting together a plan to bring this all together, to rebuild and repair. With thousands of people protesting day after day and night after night in Minneapolis and across the world, you know, we would like to see what kind of a pressure that is happening right now in Minneapolis in terms of uh, not only setting the message, but also leading the path and showing it to the country in terms of what needs to be done. So as we all know, in a nine to four split, there was a decision made very recently to disband the police force, but the, to put the money into preventative measures such as education. And we are talking about deep reform and restructuring of departments to address the systemic racism. But how, uh, you know, this, this doesn't quite mean that there will be no Minneapolis Police Department, uh, but there are other changes that we will foresee and we'll get to hear from uh, our council member in terms of what's going on with that. So, you know, when you look at other changes that will be happening include like banning of chokeholds and requiring our police to report and even intervene if another office is seen using excessive force. I mean, this uh, was clearly an ordinance that was rolled out in Dallas by the Dallas police chief. And this is uh, going to percolate across the rest of the country. Further, we have many local businesses in the area that have severe ties with the police department since the murder of George Floyd. And uh, obviously we know that all four officers involved are now facing uh, criminal charges. So, so this is, uh, you know, let's uh, get on to, to uh, talking a little bit about what the issues are. And I cannot uh, thank our council member uh, Cunningham for joining us today. And let's do a quick introduction of uh, council member Cunningham. And, uh, you know, he, um, So council member Cunningham has been uh, on the city council since uh, 2017. And uh, he is uh, essentially uh, from Minneapolis Ward 4. And one of the first openly transgender men to be elected to public office in the United States. Uh, in the Minneapolis city council election of 2017, uh, 
Cunningham won over 20 year incumbent, Barb Johnson, by 157 votes, a very narrow margin. But all the same time, you know, he was, uh, he toppled somebody who's been there in office for 20 long years. So Minneapolis is the epicenter of the social unrest. And uh, we are going to have a great discussion with, uh, with Felipe. So thank you, Council Member Cunningham. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, love to have you uh, get this conversation started. So would you like to say anything at the outset, uh, Council Member? Yes, well, first I'll just say thank you for having me. It's really great to be able to be a part of this conversation. I really appreciate the platform that you've created. I do want to clarify the record, though, that we actually did not do an official vote. Um, what happened was uh, a supermajority, so nine of the currently have 12 council members because um, we have a vacancy, um, 12, nine of us came out and formally announced that we are we have the intention of moving forward with dismantling the police department and creating a new system of public safety in the city of Minneapolis. So there has not been an official vote yet, but we are moving forward with some work even starting tomorrow. Okay, that's great. Thank you so much for the clarity. Yes, of course. I want to make sure that folks understand kind of where we are in the process because the process matters as much as the outcomes. That the process also is where justice lives. Absolutely. The process is very, very important and uh, and also the dialogue that takes us into a process. That's so exactly. Now, let's talk about the dialogue. You know, when you look at uh, how the current relationship between law enforcement and communities frayed, you know, it's sort of breaking apart. And then uh, I was, uh, uh, the other day I was watching uh, this very, very, uh, it was a stark statement with uh, the mayor of Minneapolis walking through a crowd where he had essentially declared that he would not disband the police department and I could see the anger that the crowd had. And as the mayor walked through through the crowd, it was, I, I could feel that pressure and the tension. So council member Cunningham, were you there at that particular rally that I'm talking about? No, I was not there, but I did see the video footage afterwards. And what did you think of that? Any, any comments you would like to share? You know, I think that, first of all, it's very commendable for someone to stand with their principles and to be willing to have an unpopular stance in a particular space and hold true to that rather than being swayed by the space or the pressure. Um, and I think that it's also necessary for us to have all perspectives at the table. We're all ultimately having the same conversation about the kind of outcome we want. We want our residents to be safe, for every resident to feel safe and to be safe what we need is all perspectives at the table to be able to figure out what is the best way to achieve that. Absolutely. And you know, I totally agree with that. And we need to look at all and every options. And, uh, you know, a question was asked uh, of me at uh, the last uh, youth town hall meeting that we had. And we had a bunch of youth from our local area that had joined that meeting. And they specifically asked me, and it was pertaining to one of the cities, I believe it was, uh, it was probably Mountain View. And uh, I was asked if I would be in favor of disbanding the police department of Mountain View. And as a council member elect here in the city of Saratoga, my take was, you know, law enforcement is serving a very specific purpose. And is there any need for us to disband uh, law enforcement in the city of Saratoga? And I couldn't see any reason why, because everything is great here. I mean, we have never had any issues at all. All our police officers have uh, body cams. And we have made some uh, choices to ensure that uh, that these types of situation may not, uh, will not happen here. Now, you know, you never know how things play out, you know, things can, uh, anything can happen as, 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 as it goes, but uh, taking certain precautions and ensuring that we are making those right choices will help sort of uh, make sure that we don't uh, escalate into a situation like that. Uh, it, it's not very easy, let me tell you that. It's not very easy at all. And uh, so I, I do appreciate uh, all the leadership in Minneapolis that is engaged to making sure that we are making the right choices. But Council Member Cunningham, you know, what is your take on disbanding the police? So, so my take was, you know, there are burglaries happening in my city and, uh, you know, we have optimized our police department because we don't have a police department. We have outsourced it for all, all practical purposes as a minimal service city. We have we get services from the Santa Clara County Sheriff Department, mm -hmm. and that has worked out really well for us. And we have optimized the tax dollars that we are spending towards it in comparison to very similar cities. We are probably spending 
to the tune of like 30 percent uh, or so compared to some of our neighboring cities so we are not spending a whole lot but we are getting some pretty good diligent service from them so i see no need for us to disband it but yes you know there is always a need for reform and in fact i made a couple of suggestions to our captain for for our captain to go out and work with his superiors and see how we can make that happen so so council member cunningham where do you stand on this what's your take on that and and in and kind of curious when that discussion was happening in your city council how did you express your ideas on that yes i think that it's very i'm very excited to hear that things have worked out well for you uh, in santa clara county um, what we have seen is in Minneapolis, so Minneapolis has actually been at the forefront of a lot of reform efforts. We were one out of five cities that were selected uh, during the Obama administration uh, for some very intensive reform work um, with, in partnership with an organization called the National Initiative. So we have had every officer trained in procedural justice. Every officer has been trained in anti-bias um, and implicit bias. We have had uh, policy changes. We've had leadership changes. Um, a lot of cities actually look to Minneapolis for examples of the kinds of reforms. Everybody has body cam for, or body cams, for example. Um, and unfortunately, George Floyd was still killed. And so, what that really means to me, what that speaks to, is a larger conversation about whether or not reform efforts are working. And the evidence really is showing at least here in other cities, they're not working. Um, and so that's why we've entered into a space of having a conversation about transformation rather than reform. And that's not just a semantics change. What we're talking about is right now, we, our police department's budget um, is so outsized that it is more than double and I won't even be able to list all the things um, combined with affordable building, affordable housing, workforce training, um, youth development opportunities, violence prevention. I mean, infectious disease prevention. Like, I mean, there's literally like seven race and equity, like so many different things all combined. Still, our police budget is double that. Um, and those are the things that we know actually keep people out of the life of crime and, vi and violence and the involvement with the criminal justice system. So when we talk about dismantling the police department, what that, that doesn't mean we're dismantling safety. That means that we're reimagining community safety. So an armed police officer is not the best response for every crisis. And this is something that I've talked to many officers about and they agree with. When somebody's having a mental health crisis, it is not always the best, rarely is the best response to have someone show up who is armed. Um, you know, it, it, when somebody is overdosing on opioids, having an armed response is not necessarily the best response. And so what we need to do is right size our police department, have them be very focused to do the training that they like, or to do the work they were trained to do really demilitarize it because right now it's very much so a hierarchy which is why you had uh new you had rookies out on the street who also got in trouble um with the officer who killed um mr floyd because they didn't feel comfortable to correct their superior so like that sort of culture that sort of dynamic that is what we have to fundamentally change as well i don't believe that firing everybody, making new rules, and then hiring like new people, I don't think that that's actually gonna get to it. What we have to really think about is a full restructuring and right-sizing the police department in comparison to other forms of public safety. Yep, I, I have to agree with you on that, Council Member Cunningham. So that brings me to a couple areas, right? One is uh, when you look at uh, uh, cultural issues and perhaps uh, barriers that exist in terms of how we have a specific culture has been propagated across uh, the police department. And you reference how President Obama picked Minneapolis because perhaps there were things that needed to be shifted. And what happens is a culture gets passed from one generation to the next. And when you have uh, new police officers that are recruited into the police force, that culture is sort of uh, passed on to them. And I would love to get your thoughts on that in terms of what can we do to, to address that? And is that really a problem or perhaps it's not? Secondly, when it comes to, for example, training, you know, I've seen stats where uh, a police officer typically spends about 58 hours in shooting 
versus eight hours in de-escalation. And you make a very good point, Council Member Cunningham, that we need to look at other options. You know, can we uh, can we approach social workers? Can we engage them to to de-escalate? I mean, uh, you know, when we look at our police officers, they are putting themselves in harm's way, and their stress level is always a little elevated compared to a normal person. You know, if if I'm driving on the road and we have a police officer driving on the road, you know, the not the stress level of the police officer is a notch higher compared to me. You know, I'm probably a little bit more relaxed. I'm listening to music. So that kind of elevates or rather escalates certain types of situations. So how do we address that? You know, if we sort of, like you said, Council Member Cunningham, if we make sure that our police officers are attending to very specific uh, types of situations, and then we have other social workers addressing others, that might be a great approach into this. And uh, a total de-escalation, you know, when I looked at that crowd gathering and how the mayor was, he was sort of walking through it and, uh, and feeling the pressure, you know, but standing tall and standing true to what you believe in is sort of very important. And I, I respect the mayor for that, but I would love to get your thoughts on these two aspects, the cultural aspects of it, and then also in terms of de-escalation, you know, what can we do to address that? Yes, those are really great questions. The first is, I can't tell you how many times I have heard from new officers um, or veteran officers who witness this behavior where they'll be sitting in a training and they're like, oh, we gotta go to this training that they're requiring of everybody. It's like some veteran who's been on the force for 30 years will lean over to the rookie and will say, disregard everything they're saying, that's not how the real world works. And so they then take on this idea that, you know, these folks who are doing the trainings obviously don't understand what they go through. And so it, it, they disregard what they're learning. Um, I will say that, uh, that that's really hard to change. I used to be a teacher, so I, I'm a special education teacher by training. Um, and that, that's, I used to be a youth worker and special ed teacher. And I had the same exact thing, honestly, when I was a teacher. Like I would have veteran teachers who would say, throw out the textbook, none of that is actually like really how kids work and blah, blah, blah. And uh, fortunately I, I didn't really buy into that, but you know, the, the, there's just a culture of like being defeated and not believing that change is possible. Um, and that other methods of doing the work is possible or effective. So that's um, a part of the culture change that we really need to look into. Who are the folks who believe that they could do their best work if the system is different and that they wanna be a part of investing in that new system rather than nothing's ever gonna change so we should just keep it the way it is. On the second component, on the training, I will say that every police officer in Minneapolis has also been trained in de-escalation. And they've had, I believe, 40 hours worth of training um, with de-escalation. I'm sure it works a lot of times um, and folks utilize those skills. I will say that we spend a lot of money of taxpayer dollars and settlements because of the fact that they don't de-escalate situations. So it's not always appropriate to have them respond to every incident because they inherently just their, the energy, like you said, they're, they're coming into a uh, situation. The last call that they just dealt with was stressful. Now they're showing up to this call with that stress from that situation, bringing that into this bringing folks who were at an eight to that 12 and escalating the situation. So there, there's a lot of layers there. First, we have to talk about officer health and wellness, the ability for them to be able to um, be mindful and like leave the situation behind as they go to a new situation. Um, but again, I really do go back to like the question of Reforming the current system as it is has not really proven, at least again, I'll speak here in Minneapolis, but the data is playing out in other cities as well. Um, we have not seen that playing out in a way that actually has shown cultural change within the institution and the subsequent officer behaviors after that. Great points there, council member. So let's, let's talk about you a little bit. You know, when you, <clears throat> when I look at what you did, you know, you are extremely active in your community. And when the protest and the riots happened and the looting was happening, you actively went down into the streets. That is very commendable. I mean, you have a lot of courage. 
and you were out there assessing damages, but you also look to understand the severity of the break-ins and fires in hopes of fixing those communities. This is what every elected leader should be doing. And I salute you, to you for that. You know, you are looking to transform your local economy by building the black indigenous people of color owned businesses. I mean, you have done your part. You want to understand the challenge and you want to see how we can bridge the inequality, the economic inequality that exists today. You are a policy maker and you are a chair of the Public Health Environmental Civil Rights and Engagement Committee. You have worked with Asian American Organizing Project and Southeast Asia Dis uh, Diaspora Project as well to move closer towards collaboration. And above this, you are striving for equity across all city departments. So tell us, tell us one thing, you know, the question is what action can we as individuals and communities take in the wake of too many deadly encounters between citizens of African descent and the police? Any specific rec recommendation you have, Council Member Cunningham? So this actually is connected to a larger conversation among racial inequities um, and the disparities that have just been intentionally baked into our government system since the founding of modern-ish America. Um, and uh, I should say maybe American democracy. So what I would say folks need it to do is first understand the so I recommend for folks to read Color of Law um, to be able to have an understanding of how government actually explicitly made laws that made it impossible for, for Black folks in particular to be able to buy homes, to be able to start businesses, and how those policies from government actually created what we have today. I also recommend for folks to learn about how do you, um, how do you talk about race? That's one of the things too, is that we as a country have not been given the tools to be able to talk about race in a productive way. Um, race or privilege or power, um, white supremacy, uh, those are very activating words for folks who do not have the skill sets to be able to talk about race in productive ways. So folks need to really be able to, to handle that. So I, I recommend white folks who are interested in being allies to read the book, White Fragility, uh, that's a really great book, as well as How to Be an Anti-Racist. There are, uh, and buy those books from Black-owned businesses, please. <laughs> um, and so uh, those, those are some of the recommendations. It's like learning the self-awareness work of being able to cope with the energy that comes up, that gets activated when we talk about race, because we don't have, a, have the skill set here in this country to do so. Um, as well as learning about how we ended up where we are today. There's lots of really good, um, there's the color of wealth and the color of law. So I recommend for folks to dig into that and learn more about how we got here because public safety is just the, uh, is the outcome. It's not the, uh, it's, a, it's a symptom rather than the illness itself. Very well said, very well said. So I'm, I'm looking at uh, Facebook, uh, you know, we are live streaming on Facebook and there are a couple of chatters and let's see, uh, Laura Rocco, Laura, Laura Rocco, she's made a comment of, uh, she just says defund, and that's the comment that she's made. Mm -hmm. And uh, Lynn Heidekoper, what she's saying is that, what are we going to do with all the groups who want to start a race or civil war? They showed up to create havoc at the legitimate peaceful protest. Uh, Boogaloo Boys, many different white supremacist neo-Nazi groups and uh, and etc. Right. So so any any comments on that, uh, Council Member Cunningham, with respect to what Lynn is saying? Yes. So the so in Minneapolis, when when folks saw the protests and the riots, that largely happened in South Minneapolis. I live and represent North Minneapolis, and um, that is where the concentration of Black folks live in our city. And so we didn't have big protests and riots in North Minneapolis. What we saw actually were very strategic destruction through fire of particularly black businesses and immigrant owned businesses in our community that were burned. Um, we also did have the little boys who showed up and it was a very odd situation where they were like, 
we're here to help protect the neighbor. It was a very bizarre dynamic. Um, but what we did is we ended up creating our own community patrols to be able to, because the police weren't showing up to help. Um, we created our own community patrols and protected our, our small businesses and critical infrastructure. That being said, um, I will say that I'm very nervous about folks who are out here very committed to a second civil war, a race war. Like, um, you know, my, my parents, I, I was raised in, and my parents still live in a small town um, in Illinois. And um, I know that there are folks there who are stockpiling guns and bullets because they're very convinced that a race war is going to happen. That's just a different, like an, an alternative reality to what I feel like most of us are, are living within. But this is really where we need white allies because you gotta talk to your family. You gotta talk to, you know, your friends from high school. You know, like you gotta still, you gotta talk to the people around you to be able to help uh, deconstruct this narrative that, that they've created around themselves. And that's really where we need folks to do the work, learn, about white, uh, white fragility, white rage, talk about anti-racism and, and white supremacy and be able to get the language to be able to talk to other white folks to be able to help change that, those dynamics. So, so you, you know, from, from what, we, what, what I hear, you know, I think uh, it's important for us to have allies and for us to team up and have those types of conversations, you know, I think uh, we cannot approach it from a very siloed community. It's not a black versus white or black versus white versus Asian versus everything else, right? I, I don't think so. It's about that. You know, we are all Americans here and we have to converge upon common ideologies and we have to figure out, you know, a path forward. And, uh, so, you know, to some extent, uh, when we see, you know, this eruption, you know, this is almost like a geyser that is dormant. You know, I've, I've been to, to Yellowstone and, and watching those geysers, you expect them to erupt. And then something like this happens, you know, we are all like bracing, like, oh my God, you know, something is going to happen now. And then boom, you know, just like that geyser, it just erupts and it goes on. And then suddenly it goes quiet again as if nothing happened. Yes. And that's the problem we have, you know, as yeah. if nothing happened, you know, how are we going to once and for all put this behind us? So council member Cunningham, my question to you is, do you see a perceptible shift, a reality check and reconciliation of values and how we are going to move forward? Do you see anything like that happening in our lifetime? Yes, if you would have asked me two weeks ago, shortly after Joy, George Floyd's death, I would have said that this is just another Groundhog Day where we wake up and we do the same thing over and over and over again. I will say that being on the ground as an elected official, like literally out of community doing the work, that this time feels really different. Um, and I think that what makes it so different is that we have a multicultural intergenerational coalition of people who have come together and have said enough is enough. Um, that is really unprecedented um, in terms of social movements where we have such a diverse group of people who are all in for change. What makes the difference is I need to remind folks that the uh, Montgomery bus boycott that was led by Dr. King that lasted for over a year. That means that folks walk to work. That means they carpooled, they inconvenienced themselves for over a year to, to get the buses desegregated. And so um, the, that's a commitment. And what we need is a commitment. We live in a time of rapid, um, you know, immediate gratification and, you know, moving on to the next like, news cycle or the new thing that's happening. And no matter what changes, we need folks to recognize that racial justice impacts all of it. So if we're talking about, you know, another spike in COVID-19 infections, 
racial justice plays certainly a role in that. If we're talking about the economic recession that is about to really blow up in our faces as a result of, of COVID, that has disproportionate impacts around racial justice. Right now, the catalyst is around policing, but at its core, it's about racial justice and healing over 400 years of oppression and how that's been baked into every aspect of our life here in the United States. So what, in order to keep this work going and this energy going, folks have to be committed to continuously showing up, whether that's in protest, which I recommend folks continuously showing up for that, as well as um, getting involved, whether that is doing food distribution in the community, hosting uh, community like neighborhood group conversations about race, like those, like keep doing the work. Uh, this is the first time we as a country are actually beginning to have a productive conversation about race. We can't let up because the news turns to something else. Absolutely, absolutely. I agree with you, council member. We can't let up and we have to push this and see where we can take this, not from violent means, but from peaceful demonstrations, from expressing, uh, either it's on social media or perhaps it's face to face, but we have to express our voice and we have to keep the pressure. We have to sustain that, that boycott, the Montgomery boycott that you're referencing. In our world today, we have to sustain that and we have to keep the pressure on to see where we can shift. How can we shift the, the, the angst of people? And this is not of decades, we're talking about centuries. Now, this is the time we need to move forward. So let's, let's uh, this is my last question because I know you are, you have to go. And uh, so this is about the Obama Foundation. You know, they had you on Obama's MBK, which is My Brother's Keeper Alliance series, uh, the Alliance Town Hall series, Anguish and Action, which strive to reimagine re policing in the wake of continued police violence. Can you share anything that you haven't yet shared so far about your passion for building new systems for community safety? What was your learning and what, what's your, uh, how do you see us moving forward in that direction? Yes, thank you for that question. Um, first and foremost, I want folks to know when we talk about reimagining public safety, because I'll, I'll expand, because the topic was uh, reimagining policing and I, push back and say, we need to reimagine public safety overall. We're not starting from scratch. It's not like we're just pulling ideas. There's actually a very clear framework that exists and it's called the public health approach to public safety. It thinks about violence as a disease that spreads. It spreads interpersonally from person to person. It spreads intergenerationally. And like any other disease that is infectious and spreads, it can be prevented and it can be treated. What we need is to be investing in evidence-based strategies that actually get to the root of the problem so that we're interrupting violence as it happens, as well as preventing it in the, from happening in the first place. While we've seen very clear evidence that over-policing, criminaliz criminalization, mass incarceration, those have very overwhelmingly not made communities safer. In fact, it's only further marginalized particularly black folks, but black and brown folks overall. But the public health approach to public safety does work. The evidence is coming back. So if folks are interested in learning more about that, I highly recommend it. Um, if you uh, Google search, violence is a contagious disease, there's a, a whole series of uh, papers, white papers on the, on, on the public health approach to public safety. There is, um, there are also just general frameworks that are out there. So if you just Google search public health approach to public safety, that is what we need to be focusing on. That is what we need to be investing in. Those are the new systems that we need to be building every single day on every level of government that decentralizes policing as the main form of public safety and instead centers the public health approach that uses law enforcement in only extreme circumstances. What we know is that the public health approach works. We have lots of amazing examples here in Minneapolis. For example, I led the creation of the Office of Violence Prevention. There are office of, offices of violence prevention in other cities, 
there's one in Oakland, there's some um, in Milwaukee, and go to Louisville. Like, uh, so these systems exist, but they have not been invested in in the same way that policing has been. So now is the time for us to right size police departments um, and policing overall, and also right size by fully investing in the public health approach to public safety. That is the work that's ahead of us, and that is the model we need to be building on. Yep, I I totally agree with you, and that's uh, that's probably one of a, a really good outcome from this discussion. You know, there are a variety of different uh, legislations that have been proposed, and I get quite a few emails on these topics from 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 many many people, and especially I'm hearing from a lot of the younger voices. You know, folks who are 18, 20, 22, I mean, they have, uh, they have been sort of awakened and they realize that it's time for them to take charge. And, uh, you know, these young voices have typ typically not been politically active, but the, the jarring of watching, the jarring effect of watching that video of George Floyd being choked. You know, I mean, I saw some pretty amazing emotional uh, breakdown with uh, with that you know i mean it's it's touched touched people's hearts and uh, so i can see how our younger generation this population is sort of way awakened and they are trying to galvanize mobilize and engage to see how we can address these challenges so that we never have that ever again so that brings me to what we have done you know we have had many podcasts talking about this specific topic and this was put together at the very last minute uh, by us. So we really appreciate Council Member Cunningham for joining us, but uh, we'll definitely have you back again uh, in more of a panel discussion format in the next week or two weeks and have a little bit more of a deep dive conversation with some of the things that we talked about. We barely broached the surface today, but I would like to ask one thing, which is, uh, which, which is, uh, let's see, uh, you know, in terms of uh, any, key takeaways from this, you know, with respect to, you know, what is the one action that we need to take? So what we have done is we have a Black Lives Matter website, a web page at rishikumar.com slash Black Lives Matter. And we have put together anti-racism resources that includes reading materials, that includes organizations that we can support or be affiliated with to participate in this movement for change. So there are lots of resources there. I invite our listeners to please go and check it out. So I would love to, as a final word from you, Council Member Cunningham, you know, one action that you recommend to me, to our listeners, to anybody who watches this video, what is that one action you would like us to take? And secondly, if there's one specific reading material, what is that one reading material that you would like us to take or a documentary or something to watch that will sort of inspire us to make sure that we are all engaged in that right path? So final words from you, Council Member Cunningham. Yeah, thank you. Um, I would say that uh, for me, my recommendation, the one thing to take away is learning more about the public health approach to public safety. That is, it's possible for there to be legislation, for there to be evidence-based, or excuse me, yeah, well, evidence-based investments, as well as there's community opportunities within that, because the public health approach to public safety is rooted in community and justice, and more folks need to know about it and advocate for it. Uh, with their legislators and with their elected officials overall. And um, again, I recommend for folks to um, take a look at the um, Violence is a Contagious Disease, that particular paper. Um, the gentleman who wrote it, uh, Dr. Slutkin, he actually founded the Violence Interrupters Program in Chicago. And he really introduced a larger conversation um, from an epidemiological perspective of uh, treating violence as a disease. And so um, that is a part of a collection of a workshop that happened around violence prevention. Uh, and so that's one particular paper, but I recommend folks to try to, if you are so inclined to deeply nerd out, to take some time to start there and, and read through some of the other uh, white papers as well. It's really, it's really good material to understand um, how to actually operationalize the public health approach to public safety. That is the future of community safety and we need everyday folks to understand it and be able to advocate for it. Thank you so much, Council Member Cunningham. I really appreciate that. 
And I took those two and uh, it's there on my social media now. I just tweeted you, I tagged you, and uh, I'm going to personally uh, take a deeper interest in both these, uh, look at this paper as well, which I haven't seen before, I admit, but this is the time for each of us to engage, mobilize and act. And I promise you that collectively here in Silicon Valley, you know, we have had uh, racial issues for sure. It's not like we haven't had any, but this is the time for us, all of us to act. You know, every community, every neighborhood, every city, every county in our country needs to address and figure out how we can move forward. So Council Member Cunningham, I know you're a busy man, so I really appreciate you spending time with us. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Great conversation. Thank you so much. All right, we'll have you back again. Super. Please, Thanks. I look forward to it. Okay, great.